Good morning, Diversity Church. Well, Pastor Jonathan said uh, we have been going through a series called uh, Summer in the Psalms. And we've addressed varieties of topics of things that have been happening in the book of Psalms. Last week, Pastor Jonathan preached on uh, Psalms 23 and we talked about Psalms 3. We talked about Psalms, I believe it's 46, right? Um, Whatever. Go back and listen to the messages if you haven't listened, okay? Um, But I'm continuing this series uh, and we're going to go through Psalm 89. Psalm 89. And so today, I know people like Jeremiah will be excited because somehow, someway, his weekly posts on Facebook reach me. Um, I, I don't know if I just need to unfollow him or what I need to do, but every, uh, probably every day, Jeremiah uh, puts something about investing your money, investing your time, and investing your energy and your life and how he puts the work in, the investment, and the profit that will come from that. And so today, I've entitled the message, Make a Profit from My Pain. Make a Profit from My Pain. A few years ago, uh, me and uh, one of my best friends, Lamont, and uh, Pastor Steve, uh, I was an associate youth pastor Um, at a church that I grew up in. And uh, we would do these brilliant ideas. A lot of the things that uh, I am the way I am in ministry uh, is because of Pastor Steve and his pouring into me as a young uh, young buck. But um, we used to have these brilliant things and brilliant ideas for youth, or so we thought. Okay? And... So one, one day, Pastor Steve comes up to me and he's like, I got it. We're going to start doing a thing called Social Media Minute. And I was like, all right, Pastor Steve, where are we going with this? He's like, one minute, every service on Wednesday, we are going to display everyone's social media. And so what we do is, Really, this is what it was. It was a chance for us to say, watch out for what you post, because it might be on social media minute. Okay? And so, we started doing this thing, and really what it was is we would take one minute, and you know like the girls that'll post a picture in their bikini and be like, to God be the glory, because he has done great things. Like, you know... It's literally just your way to brag, but you put a scripture on it. You know what I'm saying? Like, I have a guy right now that he's like, he's like got all his muscles and he's like, God's good. Amen. He walked through the valleys. I'm like, bro, you just wanted us to see how, how bulky you are. You know what I'm saying? And so we would take a minute and it was just our way of saying, watch out what you post. And so I would learn the backstory of this uh, later on. We had a good friend named Roderick. And Roderick spent the entire night convincing this girl from 1 a.m. to 5 a.m. Telling her, like, girl, you're the light of my life. I want you. Like, you are it for me. I want to date you. I'm going to be faithful to you. Like, there's no girl that I've had my eye on forever. Like, you are it. And so he finally convinces her. She's like, cool, I'll date you. This is 1 a.m. to 5 a.m. Wednesday morning. Wednesday night rolls around. And social media minute rolls around. And we didn't know this at the time. But we were like, on today's social media minute, take a look at Roderick kissing another girl. Like... <laughs> And it was another girl that he had been talking to. It was a week old. He had just told these, he had just told this girl, like, girl, I have not been cheating on. I love you. I want to be with you. And all of a sudden, we we show the picture, and Rod's like, what the heck? Took his book bag and sprinted out of the room. 
And we're like, man, why is he so passionate? We're thinking he's about to get with this girl, right? Like the girl on the screen. So we go and like afterwards, we can't find Rod anywhere. We're looking for him high and low. We're trying to search. Finally, we find Roderick in the main sanctuary. And Rod's questions and statements went a little something like this. What are y'all doing? Why would y'all do that to me? Y'all just blew it. This girl ain't going to date. We're looking at the front row and this girl's face is bright red. I mean, me, Lamont and Pastor Steve are just going in on Roderick. And we're thinking like, she's just a friend. No, that was supposed to be his new girlfriend. And that night, Roderick was declined forever. That relationship only lasted about 12 to 13 hours. But he asked these questions and I can't lie, it was the most epic thing we've ever done in our history of social media minute. You know what I hated about it is because a lot of people thought it was me that spearheaded social media minute. So like all the kids blocked me so I couldn't get through to them. But it wasn't me, it was Pastor Steve, and that was messed up. But today in Psalms 89, we're addressing a lot of the same questions that my friend Roderick had that day. A lot of the wave of emotions that you saw in Roderick, he hit the greatest heights. He bagged this girl and was like, yo, she's mine now. And the greatest depths in a matter of hours of what are y'all doing? Why would y'all do that? is what we're going to talk about this morning. And so today I want to talk about how do you make a profit from your pain? Psalms 89 is a weird song. So I want to give you guys some background on Psalm 89. Psalm 89 was the last chapter in the third volume of Psalms. Okay, so Psalms are divided into five kind of volumes. Uh, for every few books, I don't know how many uh, are in each, but Psalms 89 would be the last chapter of the third volume. There's five volumes in Psalms, the collection of books. There's 150 chapters in Psalms, but they would be, it would be the last chapter, the third volume. And Psalms 89 was written by a man named Ethan the Ezraite. And this was the only Psalm that he authored. How many of you know Ethan the Ezraite? I thought so. Me neither. I didn't know before I looked it up. Uh, Ethan the Ezraite was, a, the Bible says in 1 Kings, he was a very wise man. But this is what it said. He wasn't wiser than Solomon. I don't know about you, but I'll take it to get the silver medal in wisdom. Like, if I'm going to come second in something, if I'm behind Solomon, you're like, hey, you ain't the wisest, but you're second wisest. So the Bible records that Ethan the Ezraite was the second wisest man. He took the silver medal in the wisdom category. And some say, some scholars say he was also a worship leader from the Levite tribe. So uh, in, the, in the book, uh, there's a guy named Judithin, and they would say those two are the same uh, people uh, there's two Ethans too, but they say that these people are all the same people and that he was a worship leader in the Levite tribe. So he was a worship leader and he was wise. And I began to think about that and I was like, who does that, who vibes with that? And I thought, uh, it's, it reminds me a lot of myself, you know, like, uh, you're supposed to laugh there. That was, that was a joke guys. Okay. All right. We're going to catch it first service. All right. Uh, but Ethan, I got to move on because you guys didn't laugh and you thought I was being serious. I got to joke more with you. Um, so some scholars say he was a worship leader. And then Psalms 89 is divided into two parts. It's part A would be verses 1 through 37 and part B verses 38 through 52. And this psalm is called the masculine. Uh, in Hebrews, most scholars believe it's translated to be a psalm that teaches us something. A psalm that teaches us something. And we'll see why 
as we jump into this psalm. So let's jump into Psalms 89. Here's the deal. It's 52 verses. I'm going to read them all, okay? And, uh, and it, I timed myself, and it took me about four and a half minutes. Okay, so bear with me for four and a half minutes. I know some of you, you're like me, and if you're like, if it gets too lengthy, it's like, come on now, let's get to the meat of this thing, right? But bear with me, because I'll make it all make sense, all right? Before I read, I want to pray and ask God. There's a specific prayer that as I was running, uh, God wanted me to pray. And so I'm going to pray that this morning. Father, Lord, I ask, I pray this message goes deep to reach our hearts. I pray it goes wide to reach our neighbors. And I pray it goes long to affect more than just today. In Jesus' name, amen. Psalms 89 goes like this. I will sing of the Lord's unfailing love forever. Young and old will hear of your faithfulness. Your unfailing love will last forever. Your faithfulness is as enduring as the heavens. The Lord said, I've made a covenant with David, my chosen servant. I've sworn this oath to him. I will establish your descendants as kings forever. They will sit on your throne from now until eternity. Salem. All heaven will praise your great wonders, Lord. Myriads of angels will praise you for your faithfulness. For who in all of heaven can compare with the Lord? What mightiest angel is anything like the Lord? The highest angelic power stand in awe of God. He is far more awesome than all who surrounded his throne. O Lord God of heaven's armies, where is there anyone as mighty as you, O Lord? You are entirely faithful. You rule the oceans. You subdue their storm-tossed waves. You crush the sea monster. You scattered your enemies with your mighty arm. The heavens are yours and the earth is yours. Everything in the world is yours. You created it all. You created north and south, Mount Tabor and Mount, Mount Hermon. Praise your name. Powerful is your arm, strong is your hand. Your right hand is lifted high in glorious strength. Righteousness and justice are the foundations of your throne. Unfailing love and truth walk before you as attendants. Happy are those who hear the joyful call to worship, for they will walk in the light of your presence, Lord. They rejoice all day long in your wonderful reputation. They exalt in your righteousness. You are their glorious strength. It pleases you to make us strong. Yes, our protection comes from the Lord. And he, the only one of Israel, has given us our king. Long ago, you spoke in a vision to your faithful people. You said, I have raised up a warrior. I've selected him from the common people to be my king. 19 is taking a little bit of a turn. You'll, you'll hear it. I have found my servant, David. I have anointed him with my holy oil. I will steady him with my hand, with my powerful arm. I will make him strong. His enemies will not defeat him, nor the wicked overpower him. I will beat his adversaries before him and destroy those who hate him. My faithfulness and unfailing love will be with him and my authority. And by my authority, he will grow up in power. I will extend his rule over the sea, his dominion over the rivers. And he will call out to me, you are my father, my God, and the rock of my salvation. I will make him my firstborn son, the mightiest king on earth. I will love him and be kind to him forever. My covenant with him will never end. I will preserve an heir for him. His throne will be as endless as the days of heaven. But if, the descend if his descendants forsake my instruction and fail to obey my regulations if they do not obey my decrees and fail to keep my commands then i will punish their sin with the rod and their disobedience with beating but i will never stop loving him nor fail to keep my promise to him no i will not break my covenant i will not take back a single word i said i have sworn an oath to david and my in my holiness i cannot lie his dynasty will go on forever. His kingdom will endure as the sun. It will be as eternal as the moon. My faithfulness will witness in the sky. 
Now pay attention to this. But now you've rejected him and cast him off. You're angry with your anointed king. You've renounced your covenant with him. You've thrown his crown in the dust. You've broken down the walls protecting him and ruined every fort defending him. Everyone who comes along has robbed him and he has become a joke to his neighbors. You have strengthened his enemies and made them and made them all rejoice. You've made his sword useless and refused to help him in battle. You have ended his splendor and overturned his throne. You've made him old before his time and publicly disgraced him. Selah, oh Lord, how long will this go on? Will you hide yourself forever? How long will your anger burn like fire? Remember how short my life is, how empty and futile this human existence. No one can live forever. All will die. No one can escape the power of the grave. Selah. Lord, where is your unfailing love? You promised it to David with a faithful pledge. Consider, Lord, how your servants are disgraced. I carry in my heart the insults of so many people. Your enemies have mocked me, O oh Lord. They mock your anointed king wherever he goes. Praise the Lord forever and ever. Amen. You're going to see this morning in Psalms 89, I know that took a while, but we went up, we went down, we ended up. A lot of the Psalms, they, they, they're with these laments, okay? A lot of the Psalms, they, they say about 50 to 70 uh, percent of the Psalms are laments. They're like cries out to God. They're out of grief. But you'll see this Psalm starts off high. And goes deep to where it's like, it's almost a contradiction of the two. And so today, I want to talk about three ways to make a profit from your pain. Three ways that we can make a profit from our pain. Number one, pain produces vulnerability. Let me say it like this, because that's not true. Pain has the potential to produce vulnerability. Pain has the potential to produ produce vulnerability. You want to know the cool thing about pain? You can't hide it. You can't hide pain. That even if you try to keep it in, a lot of times people can see it in your eyes. People can see it in your body language. People can see it in the way that you carry yourself. And there's a well that's created inside of you that only pain can do there's a well that that is dug so deep inside of us that only can be produced by pain look at the verses ethan starts out in 118 he's like god you are my god you are so good he goes on a little bit later uh just a little bit after that and he's like hey remember when you said Remember you, we had, you said this. And then he goes on a little later and he's like, where are you? Where's your unfailing love now? Have you forgotten me? I'm about to die. What are you doing? And it's almost like in one chapter, he shows us our journey as a believer. In one chapter, he shows us a journey. When we start to follow Jesus, it's like, Lord, we're like, a boom, shaka, laka, laka, God is good, right? We're like, hype on him. Like, your unfailing love, man, I'm going to tell everybody about you, God. Your love endures forever. You're with me. You go with me. You go before me. You are my God. And then some of the storms of life hit, Right? We're like, God, what's up? You, me, where we at? And then we get to a place where like, man, are you even good? Some people quit in the, in the second part. In the, remember when? Some people quit right there. But if you don't, then it might get you to the third part. Like, God, where are you? And can I tell you something, friends? There's something about our pain 
that if we allow it to, it'll produce a vulnerability that leads us to our victory. There's something about our pain, if we allow it to, it'll produce vulnerability that leads us to victory. You know, some people would rather keep the facade than be set free. You know, it's sad in church culture, we sometimes, we do this. We do this a lot where it's, how you doing, brother? I'm good, blessed, highly favored. And, um, and so we put on the facade, but if you walk with Jesus, no matter, uh, Nina was talking about it this morning, no matter if you walk with God for 40 years, you will go through pain. The pains of life hit. The pains of life hit. But it's, if, if it produces a vulnerability inside of me, it will lead to our victory. And most people choose to stay locked up in their own prison of pain when the key is sitting right next to them. Most people will choose to stay in their prison of pain when the key is sitting right next to them. Want to know what your key is? It's the people beside you. It's one of the keys. You can't do this life without the vulnerability of oozing. It, it comes out. It's going to come out one way or the other. It's going to come out in the way that you respond to things, the way you act, or it's going to come out in your speech, in confession. But it will come out. Your vulnerability gives you teammates for strategies to win this thing in life. You know, I, I know a lot of pain is going on even right now inside of our church. Let me tell you, dear friends, you may be sitting here right now. This is not like a complex message, right? Like everybody knows a little bit about pain, but here's the thing. A lot of us aren't really honest with ourselves in the vulnerability side of it. So we'll take a detour that leads to devastation instead of just facing it and really getting vulnerable with people and really for them to know our story. And pain has a way of connecting us to one another. Here's the thing. Pain is not prejudiced. I've said this before from this stage. It's not prejudiced. It doesn't really care if you're black, white, Whatever, Hispanic, whatever. Pain's not prejudice. And so here's the thing. It's going to hit you at some point. It's just a matter of when and where. And, 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 and the cool thing about pain is I don't have to walk through your pain to feel with your pain. Because we know what pain feels like. We know when we were in the depths of our soul of like, God... Where are you? Connects us. Number two this morning, pain fuels purpose. If we go back through Psalms 89, everything is good until more than halfway through. Ethan is distraught. He's asking God, he's saying, what are you doing? You know, there was supposed to be, David was this king, let me break it down. Maybe you, you haven't been in church long, but David was his king and God had promised like through your descendants, you will reign forever. And there's something that happened that a lot of scholars don't really know what's going on in Psalms 89, but Ethan's distraught because there's something that it doesn't look like David's kingdom is reigning on the throne. And so he complains. He's like, God, remember when you promised this? Remember when you said, David, now you're making him look like an idiot. Now he looks stupid. Because he's not reigning. And life in hell and life in, and earth is going to hell in a handbasket. And we don't really know what to do. 
Honestly, we can compare that a little to today, right? We're like, what is going on? Here's what Ethan didn't know. A few generations from now, there would be a king. And he would come from the line of David, and his name is Jesus. And he would reign forevermore. And his kingdom would continue from now until eternity. But he didn't know. Yet I want you to know that Psalms doesn't end with, okay, you solved it. It doesn't end like that. But we see God had a purpose. God knew what he was doing the entire time that even when Ethan, in all of his wisdom, couldn't understand what God was doing, God knew what he was doing. And what felt like a temporary setback was a permanent setup, a temporary setback for a permanent setup. I want to tell you a story about Dr. Paul Bland. He was a great medical missionary. And he would, uh, he would go across the country or across the world and he would help uh, people that had leprosy. So he's in this uh, leper's camp and what, he, what, what I learned from this was uh, when you have leprosy, you can't feel anything. So like you could have a complete broken leg and you would just keep walking on it until you utterly destroyed it. And uh, there were times when, uh, you know, if, if they smoked a cigarette or they, whatever, like they would literally, they could burn their lips off and they would not feel it. And he says something that was so cool. He says this, if I had the power to eliminate pain, I would not exercise that right. Pain's value is too great. If I had the power to eliminate pain, I would not exercise that right. Pain's value is too great. See, some of you would have never found Jesus if you never walked through the pains of life. You never would experience Jesus such an, if mom or dad didn't pass away, if a tragedy didn't happen, if that divorce doesn't happen. I'm not saying God wills these things, but if you didn't go through the pains and the depths of your soul, if you didn't hit rock bottom, if that addiction didn't happen, if your brother, your sister, your mother, whoever, whatever didn't happen, you never would have found Jesus, why? Pain's value is too great. Some of you have gotten your calling because of pain. Some of you, the reason you are adamant and passionate about, passionate about the things that you are doing is literally because of the pain and depths of life. Can I tell you something Nothing in my ministry that's been birthed out of me has come from pleasure. It's always come from pain. I'm saying even, even to the fact that, you know, I, in a relationship, we're, we're going six years deep. And then all of a sudden, like, I get fired from this job. And then I'm living in my mom's basement. And I've, I've told this story before. But in that moment, I don't know why. But I happened to call Nina. And in that moment, I'm like so insecure. I feel like a failure getting broken up with. And I'm like pathetic on a phone. Like I'm talking, just sobbing. And I'm reminded who I am. Nothing great that's been produced out of me has come from, from pleasure. It's always come from pain. It's always come from pain because why? It fuels our tomorrows. 
in Enterprise, Alabama, there was, uh, back in the day, they would, uh, they would produce cotton. And that was their moneymaker, obviously, like uh, cotton. A lot of you, your shirts that you're wearing this morning are produced from cotton, okay? Uh, if you didn't know, look at the tag. But, so, they're producing cotton. And they recognize they lost a lot of money. They lost a ton of money because what happened was there were a bunch of boll weevils, which I don't even know what a boll weevil is until now. Like this week I learned what a boll weevil was. But what a boll weevil is, it's like a beetle. And they feast on flowers and cotton. And so these bull weevils, literally they had an infestation and I looked it up. They lost $23 billion from cotton. That's tough. Like I lost 20 bucks one time and I'm like devastated for the whole week. 23 billion, these bull weevils would just eat their entire crop. So out of desperation, they started producing something that not every, you didn't need it. It wasn't like cotton. But they produced, they started farming these things called peanuts. And it blew up. It blew up so much so that They, the the original people that started farming these peanuts, extended all across Enterprise, Alabama. They became the number one outsourcing city for peanuts. So everybody, every farmer, there was a ton of farmers that started producing peanuts. Because they they couldn't keep up. And now, if you drive through Enterprise, Alabama, you'll see a monument of a bull weevil eating cotton. Which is hilarious, but here's the point. They made a monument of the very thing that should have been the setback was the fuel that led to their purpose. Listen to me. It wasn't the peanuts that made them. It wasn't. It was the bull weevils. Because out of desperation, they planted this thing and they made a monument to say that day was the day that changed our lives. The challenge for some of us is if we allow, that we allow pain to stop us. Some of you need to make a monument out of the pains of life. You make a monument out of the pains of life. We have to let pain fuel our purpose. Why? Because number three, through much pain comes even greater praise on the other side. My pain will be the landmark of his lordship in my life. Think about it. When the depths of life happen and when you're going through those moments of God, where the heck are you? I can't see you. I don't feel you. You don't make sense to me right now. Let me give let me tip you off if you're a new believer. It's coming. It's not a matter of if, it's when. When the pains of life come, sometimes you have to look back at the landmarks of where you saw him last. And those are the things that hold us together. Where if you've experienced God, you've seen God, you watched him move there. You watched him pull you out of a dark place. You've watched him pull you out of the depths of your own despair. Some of you are here this morning only because God impressed on your heart that you need to be at church. And you don't know why. This, is a, this can be a landmark moment. 
This can be a monumental moment. Jamar, you can come on up. We need those moments in our life because with those, with the pains of life, come even greater praise on the other side. Here's what Ethan does. I love this. Ethan starts the book. He finishes the chapter how he starts the chapter. He finishes it how he starts it. He says this. But praise the Lord forevermore. But praise the Lord forevermore. He starts with, God, you're good. Your unfailing love is so good. You've crushed all my enemies. You've done this. Now, some scholars would suggest that the end of that is just them ending the third book, uh, the third volume. But I would suggest he's seen all of what God has done. His praise through everything, through what God, what he's seen God do. The things that he's been through, the things that he's walked through. He ends it and says, but praise God forevermore. But praise God forevermore. Friends, we can be grateful to God because even in the midst of our pain, If we follow his hand, we will gain more of his heart. If we follow his hand, we'll gain more of his heart. It doesn't make sense. Some people's pain, you know, a lot of times what I say is, I don't know. I don't really understand. Neither did Ethan. He's like, God, I really don't understand what you're doing and why you're doing what you're doing and why you're allowing this to happen. Why you're so absent. Do you know, he even even goes on to say like, you know my life isn't forever, right? Like we're all gonna die. And I'd like to see you do this in my lifetime. But here's what scripture says. It says this. Romans 5, 3, not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance, character, and character, hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. James 1, 3, through four says, for you know that the testing of our faith produces steadfastness and let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Friends, I'm gonna be really honest with you this morning. I've had a hard time preparing this message And the reason being is because I felt like I was like, man, everybody knows this. But the more I pressed in, I felt like the impression of my heart is there's a lot of people in our church that needs to hear this, that need to be reminded. You get the choice You get the choice of making a profit out of your pain or it could be the demise of you and your pain. You can take the detour. You can walk away from God. You can choose to walk into other things. Or you can choose to be like Peter and say, man, like, where else are we going to go? What else are we going to do? You have the words of eternal life. And so I know there's people in this room that are walking through things. And here's, here's what I also know. There's a lot of leaders in this room. 
Don't let your, Amanda said it the other week, like don't let your pride get in the way. Can I tell you something? None of us are masters at this thing called life, this thing called faith. Me, Pastor Jonathan, there's nobody. There's nobody that knows it all, has the game plan for everything that smacks us in the face. And just like me and just like Pastor Jonathan, there's moments where we have to have these moments of like, God, like, what are you doing? I've, I've sat back on Pastor Jonathan's porch at least two to three times and been like, look, man, I don't know. I don't know what to say to you about what's going on with you. And then even for myself, I'm like, I don't know what to say for me for what's going on with me. And I think it's time that Diversity Church be the church that just we put down our walls of religion because we know truth and drop our pride and allow ourselves to be vulnerable with each other because in and of itself, we can't do it by ourselves. And let me tell you this, you can't just do it with your spouse either. And some of you use that excuse because they're safe, but you need the body. We need the body. This is why we talk about small groups, not because I'm like, we want, we want it to grow for growth's sake, but like, dude, you need people around you. Stuff's going on in my small group even now that I'm like, man, my heart is in despair. It's bothered me even to listen, even to walk and do this sermon this morning. My heart's set on some people in my small group and I'm hurting with, I'm hurting for. And so before I set this thing up to allow you to deal with it, I want you to know you do nobody a favor, including yourself, by walking with a facade. And so I don't want leaders to come forward just yet. Here's what I'd like to do. Maybe number one, you say, Jesus brought me here and I didn't even know why. Maybe you came just to see a baptism and you're like, this is going to be a cute sermon, you know, a cute little Sunday. But God literally snatched you up so this is your day. I want everybody to bow their heads, close their eyes this morning. Thanks for joining us for worship today. I'm John Collier, and I hope today has inspired you to love God and to love others more. We always want to take some time at the end to pray for you, especially if this is the first time of believing that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior. Let's pray. Father, forgive us of our sins. Thank you for sending your son to die on the cross and raise again so that he can be king and we don't have to be. Help us to learn more about you so we can live more like you. <laughs> we want you to connect with us and we want to connect with you. You can comment down below or go to diversitychurch.net and we'll see you again next week.